On your daily walk through the garden, you come across a wasp with a strange protrusion poking out of its abdomen. Lodged between the abdominal segments is a worm-like creature. The wasp doesn't seem to be doing well. Suddenly, you see movement, and out from this worm-like creature bursts a swarm of small, skittering insects. Luckily, they're not after you. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we're talking about the order Strepsiptera, better known as the twist-winged insects, or the twist-winged parasites, or some call them stylops, which is nice and short. And honestly, this might be one of the few cases where they might be better known as Strepsiptera, it's not really a super common name I hear thrown around a lot. The Strepsiptera are unlike any other order we've discussed, and they're frankly unlike any other order we will discuss. They are a Frankenstein's monster of weird characteristics all jumbled together to form a creature that makes you ponder what evolutionary pigeonhole occurred to cause its existence. Perhaps I'm being a tad dramatic. I suppose it's only natural that an order comprised solely of parasites is going to appear strange to us free-living biota. Now you would never guess it by looking at them, but this strange group is thought to be the sister group to the Coleoptera, the beetles, forming the superorder Coleopterida. And they aren't as small of a group as you might think. Right now there are around 600 described species of Strepsipterin which isn't a ton by insect standards, but it's certainly nothing to scoff at, and who knows how many more are yet to be discovered. All 600 or so species of Strepsipterin are obligate parasites of other insects, so they need a host to complete their life cycle. The most common hosts are the wasps and bees, but you can find Strepsipterins on leafhoppers, cockroaches, or even silverfish. One family, the Myrmicolacidae, are known to parasitize two separate hosts, with the males parasitizing ants and the females parasitizing mantids and grasshoppers and the like. So for this video, I think it might be easier if we switch things up and do the life cycle first to provide context when we start talking about how to ID these guys. Strepsipterans are holometabolous, meaning they have a complete four-stage metamorphosis from egg to larvae to pupae, to adult. Fresh from the egg, the first instar larvae are not your typical squishy, worm-like larvae. Uh, instar just means what molt the larvae's in. So rather than worm-like, these strepsipterans come fully equipped with legs, eyes, and cerci, and they're highly mobile. In addition to skittering around, they can also jump using their cerci and abdominal muscles. This mobility is necessary because the first task of a newly hatched Strepsipterin is to find a host. This strategy occurs across multiple orders, such as the Coleoptera and the Neuroptera, and we refer to these mobile host-seeking larvae as Planidia, singular Planidium. Now, you may also hear the term triangulin, but this technically only refers to the Planidia of the blister beetles, family Meloidae. So for the Strepsiptera, better to stick with the more broad term, planidium. I am so sorry, but this is only the beginning of the jargon, so stick with me here. For those who target pollinators, can't go wrong with flowers, and many Strepsiptera and planidia will wait on flower heads for a passing wasp or bee. The Strepsiptera and planidia target the immature stages of their host, so they'll use a flower-visiting adult as a free ticket back to the colony. Now, some might cut out the middleman and remain on their mother's host, where they can be transported back to a nest. For those that are targeting more solitary insect groups, they're just looking to latch onto a nymph or larvae directly. Once at the colony or nest, the planidia will find a suitable host larvae, and they'll release enzymatic fluid, weakening the cuticle and allowing the planidia to burst into the larval body cavity. At this point, the planidia molts into its second instar, which is more worm-like in appearance. Now, this is an example of hypermetamorphosis, where even different larval instars are highly distinguishable in form and function. And in case it wasn't clear, now that it's in that more worm-like state, it's no longer a planidium. The strepsipterans will remain in this worm-like state for the rest of their larval stage. And as it continues to grow and molt, the old cuticle surrounds the larvae, 
possibly as a form of defense from host immune function. Males will then pupate before bursting out of the host. The females, however, will remain in a larval-like state and will not leave their host. This is called neoteny. The females are reproductively mature, but they retain their juvenile characteristics, making them neotenous. The exception is the family Mengenilidae, where the females are wingless but free-living. The adult males look completely different from their larval form, and the first thing you might notice is their giant eyes. Other insects will have compound eyes. Compound eyes are a collection of units called omatidia, which each gather a small piece of the overall image. So it's like seeing in pixels. But strepsipteran eyes are composed of larger eyelets, which each gather a more complete image from different angles. The males also have large flabellate antennae, which refers to that branching structure at the antennal ends. But the best distinguisher is the wings. Like flies, strepsipterans have one pair of functional wings and one pair of balancing organs called halteres. In the flies, the hind wings were reduced into those halteres, but in the strepsipterans, the fore wings were reduced. The wings also open in a fan-like manner, and when they're at rest, they're twisted, giving them their common name, the twist-winged insects slash parasites. Their scientific name has the same origin, with strepsis meaning twisting or turning, and pteron meaning wing. So strepsiptera just means twist-winged. Everything the male has helps make him a female-seeking missile. Acquired. In most groups, the females will stick their heads out of the host and release pheromones. The males use those big ol' antennae to then track down the females. Once the pair meets, the male will puncture the female and inject their sperm directly into the female body cavity, a process appropriately known as traumatic insemination, or if you want to sound nicer, hypodermic insemination. Bed bugs and some other groups do this too. The female strepsipteran, having been dealt a rough hand in the game of evolution, has thousands of eggs develop inside her, and these eggs eventually hatch into those first instar planidia, which burst forth from their mother into the outside world. The developing embryos actually get all their nutrients directly from the mother's bodily fluids and tissues, a process known as hemocelis viviparity. Hemocelis because of how they're getting their nutrients, and viviparity because it's a live birth. Horrifying, but kind of a full circle moment, you know? You spend your life parasitizing another creature, and then you end your life being parasitized by your own offspring? I'm not saying it's not disturbing, I'm just saying it's kind of profound, maybe? I may be losing it. The males don't really have this full circle moment, they just kind of go off and die, which is a pretty common theme in the insects. You know, they don't feed, there isn't really a need to. Job is done, pack it up. The host insects usually die as well. Sometimes they don't, but either way, their reproductive abilities are normally crippled. But although their life cycle is a tad macabre, the strepsiptera are not to be demonized. These are still important components of our food web. However, they don't seem to be particularly economically important. Some do parasitize grasshoppers and other herbivores, but they also parasitize pollinators and predators, so probably kind of evens out. But you know, it's not all about money. It's okay to care about a group just because they're cool. Also, parasites as a whole can sometimes get overlooked when looking at the balancing factors of different ecosystems. What we do know is they've been in these systems for millions of years, so let's try to keep them around. Streps need hosts, so you know what I'm gonna say. Planting native plants is one of the easiest ways to get the food web moving on your property. It brings in the herbivores, which bring in the parasites and predators, and pretty soon you've got a whole little happy community. Remember, parasites are not our enemies. We used to demonize predators in the past, and we saw what that did to our ecosystems. Let's not repeat history. Unless they're like, our parasites, and they're causing massive disease and tragedy. That's a totally separate conversation. Anyway. Thank you all so much for listening. I know this one was probably confusing at some parts, so I appreciate you toughing it out. We're almost through all of our insect orders, so if you want to see things through, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future content. Also, if you have any fun strepsiptera facts I missed, or if you just have any personal experiences with them, 
I'd love to hear about it, so please leave a comment below. Peace, y'all.